about, here we go, let's talk about how do you make an antibody. How did James Wells make an antibody? And you've been following him. So yeah, get one of all three, but this is the one we'll start with. And James Wells used something called the antibot. Now, I want you to go back and see some professionally produced videos. This is one by Nature about the very idea of taking antibodies, using antibodies to fight cancer, which is immunotherapy. Okay. Really cool video because in 2014 it really took off. Uh, it was just 10 years ago, but now it's huge. And we have, um, actually, we have some people, Colin, who's going to give us one of our tours, our first tour, originally worked on T cell immunotherapy. Um, now he's working on RNA stuff, so uh, they go places, you know? Um, but uh, we'll find out more about that. But cancer immunotherapy is a big deal at the Hutch. You probably know some people who are working on something along these lines, whether this week or next week's lecture. But of course, it's very costly. You probably know how much those people have to work. And so you see that um, the price of drugs has gone up. And it's one of the things that is making health care cost more. And it's one of the things i got to say. There's always trade-offs, and we've got to keep in mind what this cost is. But it holds great promise. Now, the reason why it holds great promise in this case is because antibodies are proteins, and we can design proteins. So um, James Wells, to design a protein, you know what he likes to do is phage display, right? So he made an, a robot to do the phage display assays for him. And that's what this is. When you play it, make sure your volume's down, because it's going to blast the song from the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. But it actually fits it really well. But I want you to look at that thing, and I want you to try to recognize, oh, you recognize these kind of bottles, right? You recognize the tubing. You recognize some of the things that it's going to be doing. You're going to see 96 well plates. So you want to look at that. And I've also given you a website, and printed it out, where they say what the antibot does. Because they don't say it in the paper. They just sort of take it for granted. But because it's our whole theme, I want to read through this paper. Now, um, we're actually so late that I'm going to go so fast. I'm not going to worry too much. But um, I might call on you, OK, to ask your answer to a question. If you don't know, say you don't know. Or if you just want to pass for any reason, if I call on you, don't freak out. It's not like law school. Just say pass, you know. And I will not say you shall not pass like that previous thing. I'll say fine. So I want you to look at the abstract. Look at two things in the abstract, in the middle and at the end. I have two questions. It doesn't say antibot in it. Where is the sentence that refers to what the antibot did? Let's give the antibot some credit. So first off, try to find the sentence that gives the antibot some, that tells what the antibot did. And then other people look at the end and say, what is the purpose of this study? You always skip to the end in science. So either of these questions, who would like to answer one of these? Alessandro. Yeah, generated a toolkit. It's an interesting way to put it, toolkit. But yes, they, um, they, they made antibodies. And then they tested those antibodies. Because uh, antibodies will, proteins will not work for reasons you have no idea. At the end of the day, you just got to try it, you know? So they tried seven, uh, seven different proteins. So OK, someone else, what is the main purpose of this? Again, skipping to the end. What is the main purpose of this study? Again, look at the verbs. Right. So targeting. We have generating. What other verbs do we see here? Attacking. So, you know, he, it's kind of a give me grant money word, but um, it, it is, I think it's appropriate to attack cancer. Um, that doesn't violate my nonviolent principles. And uh, so we're attacking RAS for, and the key from outside the cell. What do you know about RAS? It's inside the cell, right? <laughs> and it's what's mutated in cancer. It's these kinases that we talked about, right? So cancer is an interior problem. And yet we have antibodies, our good, easy-to-use reagents, our exterior proteins. How do we get, 
how do we solve this problem? This is how do we use, make an antibody that can somehow see inside the cell, and thus to find a cell surface correlate of cancer inside, a protein that is um, regularly on the outside of the cell when the inside of the cell has turned into a tumor. And that's what this whole thing is. So they actually are using this uh, McF10A KRAS line, where it has this literal mutation in RAS that turns on RAS. Now, if you remember from your chapter 12 of Leninger, RAS is turned on in cancers. It's a GTPase. I believe this prevents it from hydrolyzing the GTP, so it just stays on all the time. And the cell grows all the time as a result. And you can even see, when you look at them under a microscope, this is when you put the mutant RAS into a cell. It looks like this. The cells should look like this. This is when you just put the empty vector. EV is empty vector, so it's a control into the cell. So they physically look different. It makes sense that there should be something the antibody can grab onto on the outside that is consistently different. But it's very hard to find, and a lot of work has been done. Now, I remember that an antibody that binds a receptor on tumor cells will be a cancer treatment. Herceptin is one of the uh, first examples. Um, and Herceptin will actually draw the receptors together, and that will help it to, um, to stop it from s sending the cell signal. Other antibodies can work by binding and blocking. There are other ways to mechanistically work. But if you have a binding event, you can mess things up for the tumor. Anybody know what company made its fortune on Herceptin? One hint is that we've talked about it before in the history of James Wells. This is something, this is one reason why way before I showed you Genentech was on the first Delano and Wells paper. So in a sense, Wells got his start from the company that made, that made its, founded itself on making this antibody as a drug, okay? So, and now I want you to all flip to figure five. I want you to flip to figure five and tell me there are different ways that antibodies can be used as drugs against cancer. There's three different ways specifically. It's near the end. It's the one with the mouse on the bottom. Yeah, I just flipped to it real fast, but I hopefully, um, there it is. Okay, that's what it looks like. But I want you to look at it in the thing. And I want you to look down at the bottom. And I want uh, somebody tell me those three ways. What is the antibody doing? Find the antibody and tell me how it's killing cancer. Can you uh, look in the, did they say the figure what ADCC is? Because the, the acronym is all well and good if you know what it stands for. A stands for antibody. Anybody, uh, did they even have it in the figure for antibody drug conjugate, ADC? Yes. And there's another uh, thing, I, I, I thought it might have been ADCC, which is actually another acronym, uh, the, too many acronyms. ADC, antibody drug conjugate. What is the drug, so you can stick a drug onto the antibody. Anybody notice anything about where the drug is stuck onto the antibody, what the drug is doing? It's, it's stuck onto the FC region, right? Because you do that. Yeah, Eric, do you? Yeah, yeah. So that's the good news. I mean, the immune system uses it. Why can't we? It's also, um, yeah, it's, it's more accessible. But you can put any kind of toxic thing, like even a radioactive metal, onto the antibody. Seattle Genetics, for example, does that. That's how they make their uh, money, you know, and they make people healthy. And they're combined in the pharmaceutical world. Yeah, so, so that's, uh, what, that's one of the ways. What other ways are the antibodies killing the tumors? Or what other things do you see? Do you see something, Helena? Yeah, in fact, I'll show you. There we go. So you're looking at this right here. Which part of the, which part of E are you looking at? Yeah. So here is a T cell. Here's the fragment of the antibody. You see it's just a variable region, but it's binding this right here. And they even tether it to another antibody. This is a single chain variable region, but this is basically another, an another tiny antibody. 
but this is a T-cell antibody. So they're using this to bring a drug cell. Here they're using it to bring a bad toxin drug close. Here they're using it to bring a T-cell close. So they're saying to the T-cells, hey, come over here. We've got something to show you. And help, it might even play a role in activating that T-cell. So then it can do to that cell what you saw the T-cell do to the ovarian cell on the very first slide, right? So these are two of these. What about the use of the mouse, the mouse figure? What are they, they're actually using it there not to kill the tumor, but to do something else. Yeah, for imaging, do you see, what do they, what do they say exactly? So it's a zinc probe that is active under PET scans. And it's used for, not for killing the tumor, the zinc, or actually it might be zirconium. I think they have a typo. Ah, zirconium. But uh, I didn't think that zinc had that isotope when I looked at that. So we, we, congratulations, we found an error. We should write James Wells. Um, but you can see this is a mouse with a tumor. You can see where the tumor is if you put this drug, this antibody-conjugated pet probe, into the mouse. And it works really well. You don't see a lot of the probe in other places in the mouse. You see it where the tumor is. So three different purposes, two of which kill the tumor, one of which images the tumor. Antibodies are very useful. So remember, they're looking for a way to attack antibodies on the surface. And they published it. And they said they found a way. Um, so skip to the very end. This is where you want to spoil yourself. What is the protein that they found? Skip to this section right here. Antibodies can select the liver, blah, blah, blah. And find the name of the protein. Somebody tell me the name of the protein. First, first person to say it gets a prize. The prize is illusory, but um, what is the name of the protein that they found? Technically, they say it in the abstract, too, if you want to see it. And make sure you're looking in the section that has this title. I believe that the beginning of the discussion section, oh, I think you need, this is in the non-colored part. Oh, or is it? Good point. OK, so I actually have it. OK. Oh, maybe I told you to skip too, too fast. I'm going off my memory, so sorry about that. Yeah, look in this section. And what is the protein? What's it? CDCP1. Doesn't matter what it means. All that matters is it's a cell surface protein of some sort, and it's what they found with their huge fishing expedition. Here it is. And you see they're referring to figure 5A. So now, whenever you see CDCP1, I've made it red here. You want it to light up. If you're colorblind, make it another color. OK, so um, light it up in your head when you see it. And they, um, the good news is what they found was already a, um, a target found for another cancer, which is actually good because cancer is very multifarious. And you want to make sure that the target that you found isn't very narrow. And so they found this, this target through a completely antibot-driven technique. And um, yet they, they found that it overlaps with what people found through other techniques. And so there's a lot of things about that. So how did they choose CDCP1 and make antibodies to it? This is where they have a lot of the complicated biochemistry. And I'm just going to tell you the very general parts of this. They basically screened for what was on the surface of all proteins. And they used, they compared four different things. They compared the, um, the cell with the empty vector versus the cell with the mutant RAS. And they made one have heavy uh, deuterium and one have light regular hydrogen. That way, they could do mass spec. And the mass spec could tell when they mixed it all up, the mass spec could tell which protein came from which cell. And so, um, and then they, they purified the membrane proteins again, because they're looking for a membrane protein. They did the same thing in the presence of an inhibitor that we have already developed that goes to RAS. Inhibitors are great against cancer, but they've got to get inside the cell. You see, the whole thing about why cancer is so hard is because it's inside. So there's a bunch of graphs like this. When you see a graph like this, you want to look for our spoiled ending. You want to look for CDC, uh, you want to look for the CDCP1. And there it is. 
Here they have, because they can tell from heavy versus light, that they had increased uh, expression in this case. They added the inhibitor, and they had decreased uh, expression when, after they added the inhibitor. So that's a really good sign. If it's blue in one and red in the other, or vice versa, it's a possible target because it possibly changes when the RAS inside changes its function. The protein on the outside changes its expression pattern. So you see that you have LAMP2 follows that pattern, CDCP1, ITGA3, and LAMP1 follows that pattern. And uh, technically, um, we could actually, uh, they could use it either way. They're looking for stuff that just changes, whether it appears or disappears when the cancer is there. So they did a Venn diagram where they said, um, what kind of, of proteins do we see more on the surface in each of these four cases where you have the activation through adding the mutant RAS, and then you have one, two, three different inhibitors that they tried. Which inhibitor? So here's CRAS activation. You got the highest number here. Here's the three inhibitors. By the way, does anybody know, this is completely outside the class knowledge. Anybody want to take a guess what any of those three proteins are? So you have inhibitors to AK, AKT, MEK, and EGFR. Anybody want to guess what? EGFR is the one that you have, and MEK, I think both of those are straightforward. If you're thinking you know what it is, at least what kind of protein it is. What do, you, what do you think? Exactly, it is. So K, K stands for kinase. AKT also stands for kinase, but it's a little bit, it's one you've seen before under a different name, at least in Leninger. It's protein kinase B. Um, I don't know why the thing changes, but life is confusing sometimes. EGFR, anybody want to guess what that is? What's that? Exactly. GF is not girlfriend, it is growth factor. And it's R means receptor. See, if you're guessing these things, you're usually right. Usually K means kinase in this context. I had to look up that that was protein kinase B. But then you saw that you have these. So of these three inhibitors, which one has the highest numbers? Which one works the best to change stuff on the surface when you add it? Yeah, the, um, the MEK kinase. For some reason, that works the best. It also, when you have it overlapping with the KRAS activation, you actually have 10 proteins that overlap there. So you have all of these different proteins. You have a, a couple dozen proteins to really look at, especially if you're focusing on the KRAS activation oval. And this is the one thing I really wanted to get to. So even though it brings us, it brings 30 seconds over, I do want to ask you, because this is a genuinely important and interesting question. So why do we have to look at proteins? Why can't we just look at RNA? If you look at transcripts, you should be able to see transcripts for the things in the cell and measure the transcripts. It's a lot easier to measure that, and a lot of people do it. And they do find some correlation with cancer. But they did. So here is their technique on the top. Red versus blue means red means like less with cancer, and blue means more with cancer, or vice versa. And red means less RNA with cancer, and uh, blue means more RNA. So protein on top, RNA on the bottom. And at the ends, you have some correlation. But in the middle, you got a lot of red across from a lot of blue, and a lot of blue across from a lot of red. What does this mean? Why did they take the time to show this? What are they saying with this? And what do you mean by modulated? Basically, RNA is messy. And um, it does have some correlation, especially at the extreme cases. But in the middle, for most proteins, it could be uh, causing you more mess than it's worth. Transcription is a messy process. And the inside of the cell is really messy. Junk DNA does have some function, but it also doesn't. Sometimes it's just there. Sometimes junk DNA is just junk. And this is junk transcription in some cases. Um, again, it's not useless. It's not like saying throw out every RNA-seq paper. But they did include this to say, hey, we're working on proteins that are actually outside the cell. We know these made it all the way out through translation. We know that these are actually transported to the surface of the cell. That's two things more that you don't know about RNA. And um, it seems to be worth it. 
On the other hand, what's worth it? Finding one protein out of all that work, all those robot hours, right? So we will get back to uh, that. I'm going to record the rest of this. Um, and I'm going to give you, uh, when you, when you open it up, make sure that you're taking this part of the handout, the recombinant antibody, because we're going to talk about the antibot first. Those are all the questions I wanted to ask you about the paper, at least. So keep taking notes. Um, start your reading for the graves. Find the, um, the, the reading that you most resonate with. And we will get back together on Wednesday to talk about those readings. Let me know any questions in the meantime. And um, see you on Wednesday or before. <laughs>